Hello, everyone. My name is Rich Ottinger, and I'm the Marketing Programs Manager for Park Systems. Welcome to the first installment of Park Systems 2020 Material Science Research and AFM webinar series. Today's presentation is titled 3D Printing and Oil and Gas. Before we begin, let me give you a quick overview of today's session. Due to a technical issue that we found about early this week, we have pre-recorded today's session, and we will not be able to have our typical Q&A after the presentation. We will also likely be moving the rest of this series sessions to Fridays starting next month, and I'll have more on that later on. You may still type in your questions at any time during the webinar, and we will try to address all of the questions in a follow-up email. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Dr. Advincula is a professor of macromolecular science and engineering at Case Western Reserve University and the editor-in-chief of MRS Communications. He is a fellow of the American Chemical Society and is the author of more than 250 peer-reviewed publications. Please welcome Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Well, thank you, Richard, and welcome to you all. Uh, and for those who, of you who follow our series, uh, this will be my first uh, talk for the year 2020. We have several uh, titles in store for you. So like what Richard said, you can watch out uh, for more announcements and uh, we will have a shift in uh, the day days of our uh, regular webinar series. As he, as Richard mentioned, I'm with uh, Case Western Reserve University as a research professor. Uh, recently, uh, I will be moving uh, to Oak Ridge National Lab and University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, the um, official work there uh, has begun, but I do uh, maintain a lab. Um, at uh, Case Western Reserve University. So for disclaimer purposes, I'm uh, doing this as a uh, research professor at Case Western Reserve University. So I'd like to introduce the topic 3D printing and high performance polymers for oil and gas. So what we do is to take the best of the basic research platform and translate it to the marketplace. Uh, essentially do applied uh, engineering or industrial materials uh, with a view of solving problems or obtaining the best performance cost ra ratio uh, in, in any uh, project. Uh, the field of polymers uh, enriches the solution for uh, the oil and gas industry. As you know, uh, it is a challenging industry because of the low cost environment, but uh, independent of that, uh, there are still many needs uh, in the oil and gas industry. And uh, that involves the use of polymer materials in many aspects of upstream, midstream, and downstream. So of course, upstream uh, refers to drilling, it refer refers to exploration, uh, production enhancement. On the other hand, downstream will refer mostly on the refining and uh, uh, separation processes. And then of course, what we call midstream may have to do with pipes or transport. The basic uh, need for polymer materials, whether it's thermoplastics, thermosets, and elastomers are varied depending on the uh, specific application. So we're very interested in materials, and this is way back when uh, we still have the Petro Center Research Trust area at Case Western Reserve University, dealing with high-performance materials, additives, surfactants, and new methods, including 3D printing. Uh, that will have a high value chain for the uh, manufacturing uh, um, uh, processes. So when we talk about oil and gas production, uh, we are talking about oil derived from offshore, onshore, uh, what we typically think of as conventional oil or uh, primary source uh, is uh, done by but a few countries. Uh, most of what we do here in North America especially has to do with tertiary recovery, uh, specifically with 
terms like uh, shale oil and gas, uh, uh, or even in Canada when they extract uh, oil from sands. Uh, in other words, uh, a lot of these needs have to be addressed in terms of developing and enhancing production, boils down to the efficiency and the reliability of the tools they use. So the unprecedented challenges uh, include that of uh, um, interest on more demanding, high pressure, high temperature environments. Uh, of course, uh, it won't go away whether the price of oil is low or high, is corrosion, scaling, and uh, uh, flow process or uh, flow control, flow assurance control. The main thing is to have parity between the cost of production and the yield. Uh, fouling, for example, is a big issue when it comes to uh, metals that degrade over time. Uh, on the other hand, uh, new methods, characterization, testing facilities are needed in order to verify new materials and even production methods. So there are many things that uh, we consider as challenges in the oil and gas industry, and they do not go away, whether we have cheap oil or expensive oil. Uh, once we talk about refining, transport, drilling, uh, uh, LNG, uh, we have also many challenging needs in terms of the environmental uh, uh, um, factors, in, including uh, mitigating risks such as uh, um, uh, catastrophic failure, for example, uh, disasters that have occurred in offshore operations. Uh, one thing is with drilling and hydraulic fracturing, there's a lot of interest to uh, make this process very efficient as well as improve the yield, especially in fracturing. And they rely on tools or specifically production tools or uh, 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 things needed to measure, to isolate, to uh, um, have zones uh, that uh, will be specific for a particular procedure for stimulation and so on. So when we're talking about uh, oil and gas, we're not really just talking about uh, what you get from the upstream source or the uh, downstream refining, but we're really talking about technology or what it needs to produce this uh, valuable parity between production and costs. Unfortunately, things degrade over time, and that is why corrosion, um, fouling, um, uh, scaling are very important issues that are not easily uh, enjoyed by those who work with metallic acids. So for example, casings or tools. So in this curve, you will see that it's very important to plan for degradation or, or failure of uh, um, um, tools and uh, corrosion and casings that can result in a high maintenance frequency or cost. Enter the world of polymers, and that is uh, really what I'm going to emphasize today. I'm going to emphasize additive manufacturing or 3D printing using polymers for oil and gas. So what you see here are the basic topological or macromolecular architectures of what we call polymers. Some of you know it by the better name or more popular term as plastics. Uh, really encompasses a high molecular weight or macromolecular uh, materials that have a varied a degree of cross-linking or linearity or branching or even what we call topological uh, architectures. Here you can see that polymers in combination with nanomaterials uh, can have many aspects in the oil and gas industry, uh, upstream, midstream, downstream, but also can refer to fluids, different types of rubber elastomer, elastomeric components, or even high performance polymers that can withstand uh, high pressure and high temperature environments. So for example, this is just a collage of what you would find uh, when we talk about polymers in the oil and gas industry. Uh, they comprise 
size of plasticizers or emulsifiers or different viscosive P modifiers used for uh, hydraulic fracturing or stimulation. But then you find a lot of them can go to seals, uh, different types of insulation pipes, or sometimes what the industry likes to call non-metallics. So non-metallics are really polymers that you can find in a number of parts that are included in the oil drilling platform, the derrick, uh, blowout preventer, hoses, packers, uh, different types of seals, etc. And they are very important to uh, perform well or not prone to failure. However, as we know, plastics and polymers have different uh, connotations and denotations. For one thing, we are familiar with the plastic that is used for packaging, for PET bottles, for paints, for um, uh, textile production. We consider them even weak type of materials or materials that are not strong enough or easily deformable. The reality is that when we talk about plastics, we're talking about categories or performance. So this tri uh, pyramid, which is very popular to describe the value chain of various thermoplastics, shows that when we talk about polyethylene, polypropylene, polyvinylidene chloride or PVC, uh, other types of polyesters or even nylons, uh, they are considered commodity polymers, meaning they do not have the performance that can withstand high temperature and high pressures. But rather, when we talk about polymers like PIC, PIEC, ULTEM, PBI, PEI, PSU, these polymers uh, have not only very good uh, resistance to um, the chemical environment, high melting point, uh, uh, they have very good or low uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. In other words, they can even be as good as metal replacement. So the value chain for high performance polymers as shown here is that they can have very high tensile strength or properties. However, uh, their cost can be quite high. So the, you don't see this type of polymers in everyday plastics or things simply because they can meet more demanding applications. Or for example, uh, high performance uh, thermosets like polyimid or other types of uh, cross-linking materials uh, uh, can rival peak in some ways. The bottom line is high performance polymers are not cheap and not easy to fabricate. So let's uh, focus more now on 3D printing. So, um, uh, as in my other uh, webinars, I've emphasized that one of the things I did uh, with the World Economic Forum was to describe the value and the future of 3D printing. The statement still the same in that this is a manufacturing method for the future. And here you can see a collage of these uh, machines where uh, one can use them for small uh, build volumes, hobby, hobby type of uh, projects or massive scale production or fast processing, okay? The bottom line is additive manufacturing is here to stay. It complements subtractive manufacturing. It relies on uh, polymers or metals or even precursor metals and ceramics that can be added or uh, added as layers to build up the print. Uh, you've seen this in other um, webinars. I'm just summarizing the different methods that we know of, um, more familiar with FDM, which is uh, basically available even at Amazon or SLA um, methods or DLP. However, um, methods like selective laser sintering or other types of metal laser sintering are, are quite expensive, uh, but then they fulfill a very specific need and method for production. Uh, so this graph uh, shows you that with 3D printing, uh, you have a higher cost of uh, production. Uh, however, the advantage you, ha you have is uh, you have more freedom uh, or complexity that you can build on the structure. Or the better value chain is you can combine high performance with high complexity of structure. Uh, this just shows you the type of materials, uh, metals, 
non-metals, polymers, ceramics that can be 3D printed. Uh, so let's talk about one of the more common types of 3D printing called FDM. As you can see here, an extruded polymer material is laid out as a, a um, extruded molten or melt polymer, which can start as a filament material or even a, a pellet in a half fed through a hopper. The bottom line is this uh, materials are heated, melted, and then deposited as layers. The problem is uh, you have a lot of failure mechanisms here simply because of the uh, anisotropic distribution of the oriented uh, uh, production as well as uh, a poor adhesion or void spaces or trapped air or moisture that tends to uh, increase the possibility of failure or delamination. Uh, one of my more uh, favorite methods involves that of selective um, uh, laser sintering uh, uh, as well as a stereolithographic apparatus because uh, we have the possibility of using photopolymerization or even two-photon polymerization to get high-resolution prints. In photopolymerization, uh, including DLP, uh, SLA and DLP are complementary of each other. This makes use of photopolymerizable resins that can be cured or reacted using uh, photo-initiated uh, methods. Uh, selective laser sintering involves that of powders that can be sintered, and this includes metal and polymer powders. Polymer powders have to be prepared, granulated, and then with sintering, you're actually able to produce uh, parts uh, even complicated geometries that cannot be easily accessed by other 3D printing methods. And then we have viscosity-driven printing, or VSP as I call it, which is quite versatile in terms of 3D printing any viscous liquid or viscous tixotropic liquid that holds its shape once printed. And there are many others, including binder jet, polyjet, and so on. What you have is that... Uh, in 3D printing, depending on the application, you can have a variety of techniques and materials. More importantly, the complexity is unprecedented. The ability to control the strength or the density of the material is geometric, geometrically driven, as well as materially driven. In a lot of formative methods like injection molding or investment casting or casting, uh, you have uh, you don't have much control in geometry, into volume or complexity, and therefore their function is limited. That is why 3D printing is a key growth area for manufacturing in a lot of industries. So let me focus here on 3D printing of high-performance polymers and nanocomposites. First of all, let's define what a high-performance polymer is. Uh, as I've shown you earlier in that pyramid, the high-performance polymers are actually found at the tip or apex of this pyramid and are mostly high melting point polymers. Uh, as you notice on the chemical structures, Kevlar is one of them, Kapton, PBT, uh, Ultem, uh, a lot of these have aromatic structures simply because the aromatic structures provide very high bond stability in terms of resonance and inability to break double bonds. So, for example, uh, some of the properties of a high-performance polymer include long-term durability at higher temperatures. Uh, you need high decomposition temperatures, uh, sometimes even up to 600 or 700 degrees C to uh, convert them or depolymerize this material low weight loss rates at a high temperature, high heat deflection temperature, which means you can rely on their shape at higher temperatures. And the high aromatic content uh, impacts not only the melting point, the glass transition temperature, but eventually their thermomechanical properties. So the key point here is molecularly, a lot of these high performance polymers have 
high bond strengths based on the uh, double bonds or the uh, strength of what we call the polar uh, um, dipole moment or dipole between bonds, okay? And uh, for example, uh, this material, which is called ULTEM or PEI or polyether imid, uh, has been sold or it has been in the market since it was a GE product, now SABIC or even DuPont. And it's sometimes more popularly known by the term Captain or commercial uh, term Captain. Uh, polyether ether ketone, uh, mostly commercially developed by Victrex, uh, is uh, also a high performance uh, polymer with excellent strength and stiffness, high melting point. And in many cases, this has been used uh, uh, in replacement of steel, aluminum, or titanium parts. And it's very much desirable to 3D print these polymers as well. Uh, polysulfones, polyether sulfones are products that that are even used for membranes or different types of uh, uh, high performance application. Uh, the bottom line is they have a good heat distortion temperature, very low water absorption, high tensile strength, and so on. Uh, polyphenylene sulfide, uh, sometimes uh, used the, using the name Riton, uh, is very useful for uh, low chemical. Um, activity or rather very stable, not as expensive as peak, but in many ways very useful in terms of their thermomechanical properties. So in summary, uh, these polymers, whether it's peak, pike, polysulfone, PAI, PPS, there's a lot of interest to use this for 3D printing. And uh, a number of companies in the past uh, have been able to capitalize and market this type of 3D printing using FDM or laser sintering, okay? So uh, in our case, we have been very interested with FDM printing of PIC, uh, also exploring the ability to dissolve PIC and 3D print them as a hot viscous solution printing, uh, ability to 3D print uh, polyether ether ketone using selective laser sintering and other types of precursor polymers, which are basically variations of the SLS and that um, FDM. Now, key to some of our projects, and this actually goes with oil and gas, is the or incorporation of uh, nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes, graphene, nanoclay, uh, POS, nanofibers. This type of additives can strengthen the thermomechanical properties, let's say by reinforcement, uh, 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 preventing stress crack propagation, high barrier properties, and so on. Uh, so a number of our projects uh, not related to oil and gas actually demonstrates the ability to um, order and to incorporate this as much as 5% or as little as 0.1% to effectively change their thermomechanical properties. So let's uh, narrow down now to applications in the oil and gas industry. The first thing you can think of uh, on why you should have a high 3D printer or access to a 3D printer is modeling or prototyping or the ability to come up with uh, three-dimensional prototypes or structures that you can use for limited testing or visualize a project even before production. So as you can see here, different types of uh, visualization uh, or conversion from CAD file to actual objects is very useful for design and development of tools or drill bits or different uh, valve uh, materials. The reason I'm emphasizing this is uh, oil and gas industry rely on tools, whether it's for exploration or production or stimulation. So when I uh, mention tools, these are actually downhole tools or things that you insert or bring uh, to the oil well through uh, the bore or the um, um, pipes and can be operationally used all the way to 15,000 feet. Now that's a lot of uh, depth and 15,000 pressure, PBSI pressure. That's a lot, that's quite high pressure. 
So many of these things are typically fabricated by formative methods or even subtractive manu manufacturing methods or machining. Uh, because of the limitations of the current formative uh, manufacturing process, it's very hard to introduce new tools in the market. Okay. Uh, another is to iterate or design parts that can go into the assembly of these tools. And perhaps the third uh, option is how to prepare parts or tools that can be used for repair. Many times, a lot of these tools fail or uh, are, are needs repair. And uh, every downtime of a tool utilization is very expensive. We're talking about uh, 50,000 uh, or tens or 50,000 uh, dollars per day of delay or uh, cost of renting a tool and using it in the field. Now, what we have here is a chart, which is not originally prepared by me, from, but from Lux Research, showing the different parts that can go towards high value adding via 3D printing. So you can see here, uh, I basically a quad chart uh, showing the scale, dividing the quad chart into four quadrants, long shot, futile, forthcoming, high potential. What you can see here are the uh, ability to prepare parts, including downhole tools, uh, subsea chemical engineering uh, tools or components, uh, different types of uh, materials used for uh, uh, the offshore platform or risers, sealants, pop joints, uh, hanger spikes, parts of tools, etc. For example, the use of seals uh, or sealants uh, are actually not to be uh, underrated because they can be a source of a lot of failure, uh, uh, even in uh, offshore operation. And they can be as big as packers or uh, can be as, as uh, small as things used for uh, the tool itself or completion tool. So I'm talking here about rubber. So rubber or elastomer is not very much represented in the 3D printing space now, simply because uh, one, it's dominated by 3D printing of thermoplastics and then thermosets, but then rubber can be in the form of a thermoplastic elastomer or thermoset elastomer. So in the future, being able to print 3D print rubber of various complexities, scale, or even dimensional uh, uh, integrity that can replace uh, failed seals, et cetera, is going to be a growth area in 3D printing or preparation of um, uh, mater materials and parts for the oil and gas industry. So in summary, I have several perspectives. One is uh, additive manufacturing is just going to grow as an ecosystem will be hard to see that it will not move forward in terms of many industries, including the oil and gas industry. In other words, it's here to stay, not only for prototyping, but even for limited manufacturing. So in manufacturing, one of the challenges is to achieve high throughput manufacturing. And certainly for additive manufacturing, this can be a problem or even a deal breaker. However, what you can see is that as the instrument, the new materials come into market, solving the issues of printability, the cost of 3D printing will go down, but the functionality is just going to increase. Uh, polymer materials is key in many types of material systems with 3D printing. Fortunately, there are many chemical and polymer companies who are very interested either in new polymers, blends, or even recycled content. I did emphasize high-performance polymers, a very important material that can even replace metal parts. However, they are not easy to 3D print and therefore improving them so that the resolution and strength equals that of a formatively manufactured part or or subtractively manufactured part can be used to replace metals. And finally, I did mention polymer nanocomposites, even though I did 
I show in this lecture that nanocomposites are an alternative path towards strengthening of polymer materials. Yet the use of nanomaterials also will grow in terms of additive manufacturing simply because with as little as 0.1%, 1%, you can make a big change in the thermomechanical properties of the uh, 3D printed polymer with proper nanostructuring. Okay. So 3D printing is open for innovation. Whether you're an engineer, material scientist, or a hobbyist, certainly the oil and gas industry is no exception. Many researchers, engineers will be using in the future more 3D printing and replacing of metals. So with that, I would like to end my talk. And as Rich mentioned, uh, I'll be happy to communicate with you uh, if you have any questions or ideas or comments for this webinar. Thank you. All right, as mentioned, we cannot take live questions at this time, but uh, continue to enter them into the questions module here on GoToWebinar, or you can email me directly afterwards, and we will respond to everyone with the answers. I will take this opportunity to ask one final question, which I always do, which is, can you give us a brief preview of next month's webinar topic, which is 3D printing via SLA and DLP? Okay. Thank you for uh, introducing the topic of uh, next week, Rich. Uh, certainly, as you've seen in this series, uh, focusing on 3D printing uh, for, for many industries or uh, simply educating them with the different methods is part of our engagement in the community. Uh, I would like to thank, again, Park Systems for the opportunity to deliver this content, and hopefully it will make a difference for all of you. So. Next week, watch out for next um, um, meeting, webinar, a presentation. Watch out for SLA and DLP, one of my favorite methods uh, based on photopolymerization. And thank you, doctor. Please join us for that session on Friday, April 17th, once again at noon Eastern Daylight Time. Thank you all for joining us for this session. You can find more information about Park Systems AFM at parksystems.com. And please direct any AFM questions you have to inquiry at parksystems.com. If you have any questions specific to this webinar series or for this session today, feel free to reach out to me directly at richard at parksystems.com. Also, uh, separately from this webinar series, you may be interested in another webinar we will be holding next week. On Wednesday, March 25th, Park Systems Application Engineer Jolly Zhang will present a webinar titled Recent Innovations in Scanning Tunneling Microscopy and Park Smart Scan. As I said, this webinar is a separate one from the series we are doing here with Dr. Advincula, so please visit parksystems.com and click Webinars under the Events menu in order to register for that and other sessions being held. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.